traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. Hope you're doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional homestead living, traditional raw milk products, and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. The quail chicks hatched. Wow. How did I accomplish an 80% hatch rate? Well, I do follow specific procedures to ensure a better result. These procedures are working. I'll talk about it today. Will it work for other eggs? I don't know, but you might try it and see if it works for your chickens or ducks or turkeys. Before I get started on that, I want to take a minute and say welcome to all the new listeners. Welcome back to the veteran homestead loving regulars who stop by the farmcast for every episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to the podcast. I truly appreciate you all so much. Thank you. Now let me start with the garden. Just this morning, Scott and I harvested the rest of the sunflowers. All that is left out there are various heights of stalks with nothing on top. I see a bunch of tall green sticks with a few leaves. These latest sunflowers will be added to the rest to be thoroughly dried. And once they're dried, we will get to pluck out all of the seeds. Uh, they will get an, uh, an additional period of drying. The seeds will be all in a single layer just to make sure that they are completely dried and cured. We don't want them to mold, right? Then I'll store them in a mason jar. Well, I say a mason jar. More likely it will be many mason jars. I do have lots of half gallon jars and in a pinch I might use some of the gallon jars. I like to keep those for milk but milking will end in a couple of months. If I can wait that long before getting into those seeds we'll see how that goes. I might put them in the gallon jars. I picked a few green beans this morning while Scott was moving those newly cut sunflowers inside the building. I can't seem to walk by a plant that has something on it to be picked and not pick it was just I'm just going to go out there bring it the sunflowers and then I'm going to come in because I got so much to do but no I had to pick a few green beans and the Mexican bean beetles have decimated the plants so likely this is the last bit of green beans for this year the plants may come back but by the time they do and recover enough to bloom the weather will be turning cold. It was a good year. In past years, the beetles have taken over before, sometimes before I even got the first picking. And this year, the plants were so healthy, it took a while for the pest, the pest to arrive. Next year, I may even try to control them and keep the beans going just a bit longer. I did little to stop them this year besides squish and squish and squish. And I didn't do that every day. If I had, I probably would have controlled them a bit better. But I planted much more than we needed, many more beans than we needed. And I'm delighted to share with nature. When gardening without chemical pesticides, it's always best to grow enough for us and for them. Then I talked about the bumper crop of purple-hulled crowder peas. That just keeps going and going and going. I canned nine pint-sized jars last week. A couple of days ago, I picked another batch that will likely give me another half dozen jars of peas. When I was picking that batch, I left behind at least as many still green to be picked in another few days. And to top it off, the plants are blooming again. I love growing this crop. They are very pest and disease resistant. You have aphids that will attack them, and the ants farm the aphids. I just work around both of them and enjoy my peas. The The plants always perform well with very little attention. And every year they've bloomed and bloomed and bloomed and bloomed through the entire season. As I said, they are very easy to grow and very tasty to boot. 
I also planted fall potatoes last week. We shall see if it was too late in the season. It will be days before I see any sign of plants and weeks before any potatoes are produced. Will the frost kill them before that? I don't know. We shall see. Most of the culinary herbs are doing well. The basil, parsley, oregano, and thyme are all doing particularly well. The cilantro, however, all of my cilantro died when I wasn't looking. I, I don't know what happened. I went out there one day and noticed they were all dead. And they hadn't really done well at all anyway. So there's always next year for that. I have plans for starting them inside and caring for them a little better than I did this year. They weren't really quite as healthy as they could have been when I when I set them out. So I'll be a little bit more careful with those next year. And the rosemary is still just struggling along. And I had to try several times just to get anything to sprout in in the spring, this past spring. And now they are growing, but they're growing very, very slowly. I may need to do more research on soil composition for them. I can't think of anything else it could be. They're just so slow right now. Now, lastly, the tomatoes. About five or six days ago, I picked five five-gallon buckets of tomatoes. Cleaned them all up. Put them on the ripening shelves. And this morning, I pulled out eight or ten of them that were rotting. So i got to get to them. Tomorrow is a big tomato processing today day. Well, today is a big tomato processing day also. I'll get to that in a minute. So this very large batch of tomatoes will all be turned into diced tomatoes, I think. That will be the quickest and easiest method of preservation of such a large number of tomatoes. Well, canning them whole would be the quickest, but I don't use a lot of whole tomatoes. In fact, I don't remember ever using whole tomatoes. The, I, well, I've used them, but then I had to cut them up when I opened the jar. So I'm going to cut them up before I put them in the jar. So basically, you're heating up the water. You toss the tomatoes in there for a minute or so till the skin split, pull them out, throw them into cold water, and then you're just sliding those skins off of them. Core them chop them up. I've got a great chopping mechanism. Uh, so I expect um, I'll be working all, most of the day on that tomorrow. I'm estimating at least a couple dozen jars of diced tomatoes, perhaps more. Now today I'm cooking down tomato sauce and it's ready to can. As soon as I finish this, I'll get in there and start filling jars, getting that water bath canner going. Actually, I have two water bath canners. That will each hold seven quart jars. I'll be using both of them simultaneously. It's going to be a late night. Seven, uh, not 70, sorry. Seven jars in there. 40 minutes in the boiling water bath. And a lot of that time is just getting it up to the boiling point. Well, cutting the sunflowers this morning, I also took a quick look at the tomato plants and the tomatoes ripening out there. And just about the time that I get these hundreds and hundreds of lovely tomatoes processed, another batch will be ready to pick. Perhaps not another five buckets, maybe only four this time. We shall see. I've got tomatoes. All right, moving on to the cows. And mostly what I want to talk about here are the pastures. The grass is growing. The cows are loving it. All day, that's all they do. They wander around eating and eating and eating. And after a while, they go lay down in the shade and begin chewing their cud. Then later in the day, they might go out again for another round of cropping the grass. What a peaceful life. But they're only in the front fields. So the back fields are just growing and growing and growing. So will we need hay this year, this winter? I need to ask Scott. Usually by this time of year, we have hay uh, stockpiled for the winter, but not this year. I wonder what's going on. Is this planned? An inquiring mind wants to know. Now, the goats and the sheep and the lambs, they're eating that grass too. And everything is still going very well with these ovine animals. Did you know that is the species term for sheep and goats? Ovine. Bovine are cattle, porcine are pigs, equine are horses and donkeys, ovine are sheep and goats. So that's your trivia for today. 
All of our ovine are doing very well, and I expect that to continue. The deep grass in the pastures keeps the parasites down, keeps the, the internal parasites that they have. I've talked about this before. It's easy to have a healthy herd of goats and a healthy flock of sheep if the pastures are maintained and the animals are rotated regularly to keep them from eating too close to the ground. That's the secret. Don't eat the parasites so the grass grows tall. Those parasites need moisture. So they can only grow, crawl so far up a blade of grass before they run out of moisture. But if it's close to the ground and you got that dew, yeah, that's where they are. So we don't want our goats and sheep and lambs eating close to the ground. Now the creamery, the tasks are moving along very nicely. More details are being accomplished and there are many details I don't even know all of them hurricane straps closing in the gable walls putting paper on those and soon to come filling uh, finish filling in the cracks between the blocks when doing the block work Scott left many blocks with spaces in between each block that was not filled in completely there are a lot of these places where you can see through the cracks you can see daylight before the cold weather sets in, Scott intends to have all of these openings filled. The cold weather affects how the mortar sets up. And so the plan is to have that finished before it turns cold. Our first frost date is October 15th. And can you believe it is already September? Time flies when you're having fun. Speaking of fun, the quail chicks hatched. This is the last batch for this year, and it is by far the best batch. If you listen to previous podcasts, you know I put 80 eggs into the incubator, and the normal average hatch rate is 70% of those eggs would hatch. That means I could expect 56 eggs to hatch on average. We had 64 eggs hatch. That is 80%, an unprecedented hatch rate. Now, to be fair, we have lost two and may lose a third, but still, it is an incredible accomplishment. I achieved a 65% hatch rate time before last, and last time only 64% hatch rate. And now that I'm looking at those numbers, I don't know if the 80% hatch rate is my procedure or luck. I used the same procedures for all batches. Procedures are simple. I collect the eggs and put them points down into our egg cartons. Then I spray all of the shells with Listerine. Yes, that's right, Listerine. Don't wash the shells. They have a protective coating on them that keeps bacteria out because the shells are actually quite porous. I use the Listerine to deter the bacteria on the surface. The next step I take is to keep them cool but not cold and of course we have the advantage of having the nice cheese cooler where the temperature is kept at 52 to 55 degrees it is the perfect temperature for eggs and the last thing that I do is tilt the egg cartons maybe 15 10 or 15 degrees from level just kind of tilt them up I kind of put something under the edge of one and then stack them uh, each one tilting on to the next one and then each day I add new eggs and then I take the whole, all of the different cartons, each carton holds 12 eggs, and then I tilt all of the cartons the other way. And each day the eggs are tilted in the opposite direction. It keeps the insides from sticking to the sides of the eggs. I collect eggs for seven days and then I put them all into the incubator. And some people advise spraying them again with Listerine just before putting them in the incubator. I have not done that. Perhaps I'll try it next year. What I am doing seems to be working really well so far. Now I want to go over the current quail chick situation. Initially, 63 eggs hatched and one didn't make it out of the incubator. So we had one that died in the incubator. Then two others hatched the day, two of those 63 hatched the day that we moved them all out to the brooder. So on the third day, uh, there were two new ones. And they, the eggs have to come out, of, sorry, the 
Quail chicks have to come out of the incubator within three days of hatching. And the first four hatched on Friday at 16 days. 18 days is the average time for hatching quail eggs. We usually hear the first peeps on day 17. So this was the first novel thing that happened with this batch at 16 days. I heard peeps. And then three days later, we moved 60 quail chicks to the brooder. So one had died in the incubator and two others were hatched just a little bit earlier in the day. And I judged them both to be too weak to, to move them out. So they stayed in the brooder until this morning. And the first night in the brooder, we lost one chick and then another this morning, bringing the total now to only 58 in the brooder. Well, they're actually 60 because the two that were left in the incubator were definitely strong enough this morning and I moved them out with the others. So we're back to 60. There's two brooders with 30 chicks each. Now, from where did the 64th chick come? After moving those last two out with the others, I went back to clear the eggshells out of the incubator, and I found another egg, egg just hatching. I heard him peeping, and I found the egg with a crack in it. I'm not sure he will make it. The little guy looks to be having trouble standing, but we shall see. I helped him out of the shell and have been keeping an eye on him all day. The, the membrane inside the shell was stuck to one of his wings, and I had to gently pull it free. This is what happens when you open and close the incubator while they are hatching. The membrane kind of collapses and shrinks over them. He's looking better, but I won't know for a day or two whether he will actually make it. This batch of quail chicks has been yet another adventure. The time frame from pe first peeps to today is five days. That's also unusual. A full seven days will have passed before this last little guy goes out with the others. Life on the homestead is always bringing new surprises. That's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed the latest quail story. These birds are so wonderful. And the birth cycle is so quick, I get to see it a lot. New life is always fascinating, and quail chicks give the opportunity for multiple experiences each year. The rest of the homestead is moving along in these last days of summer. Soon the season will change and the routine will change. I'll keep you posted. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and give me a five-star rating and review, or listen on whatever podcast venue you use. Also, please share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of content. Sharing content is the best way to help any kind of podcast or YouTube channel. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.